Hello. Hey. So, uh, let's see. Skype is asking if uh, I should accept all the other videos. You want me to say that or to watch? Hopefully the clock, yeah. I haven't done this with that many people before. Okay. Right. Let me try this again and I'll accept the question. Okay? All right. I'm the trace I would myself, right? I can hear you, but I hear a lot of other people in the call. Maybe you can, mm. the others could probably be uh, so friendly to mute their uh, mics. I also, you know what, I suggested I could record this uh, as well, um, locally, just on screen recording. Does that sound like a good idea? Uh, I have a recorder running too, but maybe... Okay. Okay, then, then let's get started. Yeah, I did it. Okay. So, we announce it. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we will have some, some uh, funny noise too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good evening. I come to the studio. Our meetup for product today. My name is Stefan. And uh, yeah, we, are, we are really proud to have Dave, uh, Dave Gray here with us today. And uh, we will also have some interactive session after that. But first, thanks a lot to uh, our host, Salano, this evening. Uh, question to who's from Salano here? Okay. <coughs> Please, whenever you have a question about Salano, go to this box. Uh, we both worked uh, for Salano, and I just have one story. I met someone on the conference, he said, Radical agility is so unfair. I have really problems finding another job. So, <laughs> <laughs> for employer branding. So, uh, we both are doing the product dojo. Do we need the mic? Okay, so we both are doing the product dojo. That's uh, something about products and or the product culture. Um, we do training. Some who of you have been on our, on our project? So, whenever you have a question, go to this box. <laughs> okay, um, so now let's get started. Um, so, Dave, Dave, I asked Dave about himself, and he said um, he was spending his life asking questions and visualizing what is coming back as answers. So, he's a, he's a visual person. Um, making to, to, to start uh, 93 uh, a company explain where he's uh, he's busy with doing exactly that and he says he's he's the person on, on, on the planet Earth who has been visualizing uh, business concepts more than anyone else but he's still passionate about that so I assume there will be a lot of visual in, in the talk and um, yeah, now I hand over to Dave to, to give us a brief introduction of what is called uh, Culture Map and one more thing. Yeah, this is, uh, who was attended, has attended our meetup with Alex Osterwalder? So I see some people here. You all should be aware that your chance to go now deeper into that topic of culture mapping because we will now move on, continue with this topic so that you have the right expectation. Okay, for the others, uh, it's something new, so that's fine too. Okay. Okay, then I hand over to Dave. Hello, can you hear me okay? <laughs> raise, raise your hand if you can hear me. Ah, okay, because I can see you. This is wonderful. Uh, okay, I'm going to share my screen here, and um, 
I've got a PowerPoint uh, keyed up, so I can show you uh, basically a talk. And I have some, I uh, just want to give you a little bit of the history of the culture map and tell the story of where it came from, and then we can have a little bit of time for questions. And then I think Stefan uh, is going to uh, uh, run a uh, short exercise for everyone to give, them a, give you a chance to try it out for yourself. Okay, so uh, the, the, uh, the, we'll start with this idea that culture is your company's operating system. If you think about what an operating system does on a computer, it's a, uh, it's the, uh, it kind of enables everything else to happen. It runs in the background and everything else is kind of built on top of it. So that, was a, that came out of a conversation I had with this guy, uh, Alex Osterwalder. This is a gentleman named Peter Drucker. Famous quote you may have heard before. Uh, culture is strategy for breakfast. Here's an, let's see, here's another. Well, uh, here's another quote from a guy named Luke Erstner, who was a CEO of IBM for many years. Culture isn't one, just one aspect of the game, it is the game. This is the guy that turned around IBM and uh, saved it from almost certain death in the uh, 1990s. Um, this is from a Deloitte study. Uh, top 10 barriers to implementation, resistance to change is, was the number one. Uh, barrier to implementing any uh, change in organization. And um, if you think about where resistance to change comes from and what it is, essentially, culture is the primary source of resistance to change. When people are resisting change in organizations, culture is the source. I think we have people, I, I was watching, uh, looking in the Skype chat earlier as we were getting started. Um, there's a lot of people, I think, in this group who have new teams that are starting from uh, scratch or uh, companies that have great culture and they want to preserve and, and keep that going as they grow. So that's another challenge. Um, this is a quote I heard from uh, Robert Scoble I thought was excellent. On a, he posted it on a Facebook thread. Whenever I meet an entrepreneur, I ask them what their biggest mistake was. And the number one answer I hear by far is that they did not focus on culture early enough. So this is sort of just a few quotes to get you started on the idea of why we should care about culture. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. That's an American phrase. I don't know if that translates to German, but uh, when you're, you're preaching, you, the fact that you're all here in this room tells me that you're probably already um, interested in this topic and you probably don't need this uh, information, but I wanted to share that with you. And, and I, I will share these slides with you also. So you can use this uh, same set of slides to talk to people that may not be in the room today. Okay, so let's focus on culture. What do we have to, what does that look like? Um, one of the reasons I started thinking about this in the first place was that whenever people talked about culture, it was a very fuzzy topic. It was like looking through a windshield or a fog or a windshield full of uh, rain. Very hard to understand what culture means, what it is. It's one of those things I think a lot of people say, I know culture when I see it. I know that culture is a, a problem here. I know it's great here. But to actually define that and start to talk about what that means is really difficult. Um, so trying to get from this to this, from a from a that foggy, rainy windshield to something that's more clear, we can actually see what culture is and, and see what the road ahead looks like. Uh, this is when I, um, you know, want to introduce a friend of mine, Alex Osterwalder. I think many of you may be familiar with him. If not his face, you probably uh, know the business model canvas, the tool that he created, uh, which has a, a become tremendously famous and successful. And this is Alex uh, several years ago in a, in a, uh, in a workshop where he, I was actually teaching him, believe it or not. And um, you may or may not have seen this book, uh, The Business Model Canvas. I hope uh, a good number of you recognize this is a really powerful tool. So I asked Alex to help me with this concept of culture. He, did, he had done such a good job with business models before Alex there was a lot of writing about business models, but it, it was not stuff that was really actionable and that could, people could easily translate into, how, what do I do with this? How do I design a business model? And Alex has been a big uh, proponent of design tools for a long time, a business model canvas being one of them. And I, said, I asked him if he would help me do something similar on culture. So Alex is a kind of a, a very smart guy. He had a ton of questions for me, and these are some of the questions that he started asking me. Have you looked at what tools are already out there? Um, how are people doing this today? What, what problem do you expect to solve with this tool? 
have you looked at all the theory? And he really set me on a, a it was a little bit like getting a master's degree, uh, you know, where the teacher um, kind of forces you through a, a thinking process. And it was incredibly valuable for me. And um, I think it ended up well, creating a pretty valuable tool out of it. Uh, I did read a lot of the theory, looked up a lot of the stuff. I looked at a ton of culture and performance uh, assessment tools. Most of them boil down to kind of trying to put some uh, company culture into a set of categories, maybe usually four if, uh, crap categories, um, whether they're, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, they might be competitive, collaborative, cooperative, uh, process oriented, etc. cetera. Um, but what they didn't do in uh, most of these culture tools and assessments they did not look at culture as a very unique thing. They looked at it as something that maybe there are four types of culture. Uh, cult area, cult cultures that focus on growth, uh, cultures that focus on process, and so forth. Um, that wasn't really enough for me. I wanted something deeper. And I found these guys in researching the theory, Chris Argers and Edgar Schein, one is from Harvard and the other is from MIT. They were culture researchers and they had a very different approach, which they called exploratory inquiry. This approach is much more about every culture being unique and different and, uh, you know, that cultures are not simply a control culture or a collaborative culture, but culture, every company, every group of every team has its own culture that can be very unique. And I'm sure even in Europe, looking around Europe, you could probably see that there's way more than four types of uh, culture in different countries and different organizations. Um, and that seems to be that seemed to be an overly simplistic approach. So I wanted to, uh, you know, starting with exploratory inquiry. Um, these are the these are the kind of sort of the philosophy. Uh, exploratory inquiry is very much like uh, anthropology, kind of an anthropological approach. These are the quotes: "Ignorance is the outside consultant's greatest lever to figure out what's going on. Uh, gather data, observe behavior, make recordings, ask dumb questions." You may see in this some similarities with Lean, the Lean startup approach uh, with agile software design, but especially the Lean startup. This was, to me, felt very compatible with what I wanted to try and do and actually truly try to understand culture as a very unique thing to every company. So then the next question, can culture be designed? This was something that Alex and I were very curious about and interested in, and we embarked on this together. Uh, so here we are in a room in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, uh, really starting to put uh, to, to get to grips with this with Alex and his team. Um, we looked, we went through a lot of different iterations, a lot of uh, design ideas. Uh, then we took it out and we tested it. Um, we, we this was the first culture map. Um, we took it out, we tested it. You know, Alex is a big fan of test and iterate. Get a minimum viable product out there, test it, iterate it. I'm just going to quickly go through some of the iterations that we went through. Um, there were quite a few of them. Uh, this was a, uh, there is a uh, model out there, an iceberg model that uh, we decided to try and uh, absorb into this. Uh, we found that this was getting close, but the fact that there was, um, when we were working with metaphors, one of the things that we discovered was that there are um, other tools out there and uh, we had people looking at this saying oh I've done the iceberg exercise before so this isn't I don't need to do this and I think that we realized that um, there's perception and all these things that go into making a good tool um, and this is the tool that we've ended up with um, it's still uh, got beta on the um, uh, in the title area as you can see but we have been using this with organizations um, for the past couple of years with a, a lot of success. It's been uh, really fascinating. I, I wanted to show you all the iterations because although this looks pretty simple, it actually took us quite a bit of time and energy and testing to get to this level of simplicity. You will see that it has questions on it, very much like uh, the questions that are written on the, uh, on the business model canvas. Some of you may have uh, actually taken a look at this before you came here today. These are the kind of these are kind of trigger questions that will help you ask the right questions as you use the canvas to try and get to the right um, information. And the way I, I like to describe the culture map is um, a as a uh, as a tool that you know, I, I usually like to draw on it. So you think about culture. 
a good metaphor for culture is a garden. Um, the three categories we have on the culture map, the, the center here is behaviors. Usually this is where I start. I start asking people questions like, what does a great day look like here? Tell me what's a great day. What does a terrible day look like here? How do we do things? What, what's an example of a typical behavior? We start to collect behaviors. Underneath those behaviors are the enablers and blockers, the things that make those behaviors possible or impossible, things that are helping those behaviors or getting in the way. And up here we have the outcome. So we do these, uh, we set up the business environment in this way. Therefore, we get these kinds of behaviors. Therefore, they get these kinds of outcomes. And this becomes a very useful way to think about the, uh, the whole process. So I like to describe culture as having, you know, it's, it's not something you can design in the way that you would design a car. Um, you know, a car, you can design every little piece of it. You can, once you've designed it, it's repeatable. But culture is, is designable in the way that you design a garden. And you know, if you think about a garden, the, the way that you design a garden is very much um, partly what you intend and partly what is possible within that soil, within that climate, and partly what can actually happen. Um, you know, there's things that are a random chance, rain, drought, floods, etc. So in any company, the enablers and blockers are those things that are in the uh, environment. These are things that management usually can't control. Things like the, um, the way the office is laid out, the structure. You're all in a beautiful room right now, in a beautiful uh, uh, building. I, I was having a look at it earlier. So that there are certain things that are going to be possible in that room that are just not possible in other kinds of rooms. Um, there's a lot that management does by their own behavior that sets the tone for the organization. Um, there are the, the, the way that the work is organized, how groups are set up, and so forth. The, there's the unwritten rules in any organization, and sometimes there's simply just habits, habits and routines that have, we've always done it this way, therefore we're going to continue to do it this, this way. Those are the roots and the soil that your culture is going to grow in or not. And those are the things that are typically, in a lot of culture exercises, can be ignored or overlooked. So this deep enablers and blockers category is the most important part of the culture map, in my opinion. It's the most innovative uh, piece of the puzzle. Uh, the behaviors are the things that happen because of the work environment, because of the climate that's around it, because of the way things are set up. And then uh, if, we, if we act in a certain way, we get the fruits of the garden, the things that grow, the plant, the, uh, the things that we harvest, that the outcomes that we care about, the results. Um, when we do a culture mapping process, there's a whole set of activities that we do with a, this is something that we often do in large organizations. We start with some planning. We'll do some culture mapping sessions using the culture map. We will then pull some findings together that we then go over with perhaps the executive team. Um, that, and we will take those findings and try and prioritize and visualize the culture that we're trying to create. So there may be a culture that exists and a culture that we want to preserve. Or there may be a culture that we need to change and we need to visualize and create a new, uh, move the culture in a new direction. Then we'll actually take that uh, from the sticky notes into a visual, and I'll show you some examples of these. Then we'll do some, um, some surveys and some, uh, and some, so we can actually measure the change in behaviors. Then we'll roll out, we'll, we'll show people the culture map, we'll talk about the new behaviors deploy that, and then we do do surveys and measurements. So I, I do want to talk a little bit about measurement because I think that is an important piece of any culture um, initiative also. Uh, just like anything else, any other asset in the company that you're managing, you're managing your, your costs, you're managing your profitability, your revenue, your sales, you want to have a, some kind of a, a systematic approach to thinking about culture as well because it's a tremendous asset or it can be a liability for a company. So we start usually by doing this, we're, we're doing some kind of a mapping of the current state that might have things, and you can see the colors, green being maybe the, the garden that we want to create, um, orange might be problem areas, uh, some of the uh, blue might be things that we're not sure if they're positive or, or negative things, but we see them in the culture. Um, from that culture mapping exercise, we'll then take those things and pull them together into uh, sort of these statements. So this is from a Word document, but you can see that there are things we want to be moving away from. Whoops, sorry. 
And there are things we want to be moving toward. So in this case, in this organization, they were moving away from uh, a really unclear signals coming from leadership. People weren't sure what leaders wanted. They wanted to move towards a much higher degree of clarity where people have a shared understanding of the purpose. So, and that was one of these categories over here. So you can see that we actually had several categories of things that we wanted to move away from and things that we wanted to move toward in this organization. Uh, and then you take that information to senior leadership and you do some, this is where we do this uh, kind of uh, thinking and brainstorming about what's the culture that we want to create and what are the enablers and blockers that we can put in place to help that culture emerge. What can we do as a leadership team? Um, we'll take that desired state, which might be sticky notes, and then we, we actually will um, visualize that into a visual map that makes it very explicit and very clear so people can actually see uh, how those, what those things are in terms of behaviors and how they might, um, how they interact with each other. And then we, uh, we roll it out, we put the map in front of people, we'll do some iteration and testing just like you would with any piece of software to make sure that people understand it and they're taking the right information away. This is what the uh, final maps look like. These are the ones from our company. So you'll see we have uh, a map that we use for our culture, but we also have a map of our, our stra business strategy and a map of our vision. So we have these things that we are uh, continually updating uh, this is the, the latest version, um, just to give you a sense that we're continually up updating this, just like you update the strategy uh, and vision and so forth. So we're, we're taking the culture and we're looking at it in the same way. I'm sharing these because they're my company. That not every company feels comfortable sharing this stuff. And then we will measure. Um, we're actually surveying people how we're doing on culture, how close we are to the culture map, and we're trying to move those habits from uh, one point to another. So this is actually a, a, a survey that we do every quarter to see how we're doing on culture. Uh, so this is a process. I will share these slides with you so you can look at them uh, later. You don't need to absorb this all right now. And I do believe that um, Stefan and uh, his team there are planning to do an exercise with you today to help you kind of get a handle on the culture mapping and um, do some culture mapping of, on your own. Um, I've also set up a, uh, for those who are remote, if you want to get on and, uh, and look at the map and maybe put some thoughts in, I should set up a, uh, an online culture map using a tool called Board Thing, which I'm uh, uh, one of the founding members of. So for, this is a tool for doing this for with distributed teams. Uh, so I wanted to share that with you. This is a short link if anyone wants to uh, write that down. This will get you there so you can actually check it out and put some sticky notes up there if you like. This is more for the remote people. And then um, that's it. I have three books. Uh, stuff I mentioned, Game Storming, I think uh, it's probably the most popular. Um, one, I've also written a book called The Connected Company, which is about uh, you know how to think about the company of the future, digital organization. And there's another one that just came out on more on mindset. Um, this is a link where you can go to download the culture map and learn more about it. There's a bunch of articles and things that have been written. This is how you can find me on Twitter. And uh, thank you very much. I'll take some questions. We can and we can take it from here. So now it's time for questions. Um, I got one, uh, Dave. Um, yeah. What is the relationship of the model from Edgar Schein that you, uh, uh, at least you, you presented him in a quote, with this uh, assumptions uh, uh, and artifacts relationship? Uh, he has also these three levels in culture. I don't remember exactly what uh, to, mm -hmm. to your model. Is this, is this connected or is this an alternative? or? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, so Shine has a, has a pyramid, and he uses words like values, and um, I, I, they, I don't uh, I don't know they don't all, all come to mind directly for me right now. But he has some words. We had some words in there like uh, levers and values, and this is why uh, I think the testing is so important. Um, Alex and I have done a lot of uh, workshopping this with teams, and what. Uh, this is a thing that I learned from Alex that is well, uh, really a big mark of his genius, I think. He is very, very focused on anything 
where people get confused or where they have trouble interpreting a statement or an idea. And values happens to be one of those uh, phrases or terms that is means a lot of different things to a lot of people. And you can, you know, when people talk about values, for example, you'll have people say, well, you know, what do you, what does it mean what we value? Does it mean what we care about? Is it our character? And so what we did in the course of a, a couple of years of testing was really to hone down on those, any phrase or thought or question that might be confusing or misleading or that generated discussion that really wasn't helpful, you know, these side discussions about what does this mean and what does that mean? And, and uh, a lot of that stuff is not actually helpful to get people, you know, uh, uh, to focus on the stuff that they need to focus on. And we did find that uh, the thing, the difference between what we are doing and what Shine and uh, Argerus were doing is that we're actually trying to create tools. We're not just doing consulting work. We're trying to create tools that people can use to do design of these uh, kind of activities. And I think um, um, uh, in order to create these design tools, you need to test them in the, with the users in the same way that you would test software with users. So uh, in the course of all that learning, we did end up boiling down and simplifying quite a bit. Uh, the terms enablers and blockers uh, ended up being extremely useful. Uh, they, everyone seems to understand pretty quickly what an enabler is and what a blocker is. And whether that enabler or blocker might be an assumption or a belief or a value, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a, something that's enabling the behavior that you want or it's blocking the behavior that you want. And uh, that's what really, at the end of the day, matters. So I think it's um, the things that are, are different are, uh, uh, are things that emerge during testing and they're uh, mostly about making it more usable, if that makes sense. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Any does questions? It, does this work too? Yes, it does. Hi, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so very interesting. Um, I would be interested to know, uh, based on your experience going, doing this cultural mapping, <coughs> this cultural design, going through this um, discover, design, deploy phases, uh, could you put any timing on that? How long, if you, if you work uh. with this company, how much time do you spend? Yeah, and yeah. it depends on the size of the company, etc. But if you give us some benchmark data. Yeah, it depends a lot on the size of the company, and it, I, it also depends on the pace at which uh, the company. The larger the company, the the slower generally uh, things move, um, and the, sometimes it's, we have to schedule these things. We had uh, one recently where we actually did the culture mapping at three different sites. We did one at the headquarters. We did. One at a, um, a uh, uh, we did also two at offsite locations. Um, we like to do those in person. Sometimes we do them virtually. But what I tell people uh, generally is that from the initiation of the culture mapping process to actually being in a position where you're ready to roll something out uh, can usually be accomplished in, in a business quarter, one quarter, three months. Um, that's assuming that. Um, they are going to make the people available, that they're going to make the timing available, and we can schedule things and so forth. Um, in a small company, I think it could, could move even quicker. But, so would you design with everybody, like make it truly participatory? Or? I think in a small company, you could do that with everyone. Uh, in a large company, what we would typically do is we do some surveying, so we'll start with a, a company-wide survey that might uh, have some questions that are related to the culture map questions, uh, but they might be designed in such a way that they're very easily consumable and answerable. Um, we, we will usually do a baseline before we do any roll anything out, um, but then we will also do focus groups, uh, sessions of, of five or six people, and we might do maybe uh, 10 or 20 or of those. Uh, across a sampling of different groups and divisions within the company, uh, and then consolidate that all up for the leadership. And that so that might take a maybe a month or two of uh, session work where we're collecting that very uh, tangible, real feedback from people, and then that goes to the executive team. And it, it is interesting. One thing I will note uh, is that 
I think it's very, it can be a two-edged sword to do culture mapping. If you're trying to change a culture in an organization and uh, your leadership in an organization, you should be very, uh, you need to be very committed as a leadership team that you are going to carry it forward. Because if we go out and do surveys and we go out and, create and do focus groups and interview people, they're expecting something to happen out of that. And if we then collect all that information, we bring it back to the leadership team and the leadership team is unwilling or unable to make significant changes based on that information, or if they're going to discount that information and saying, oh, well, this is a few bad apples uh, saying that or, or what have you, uh, that it's worse than not doing anything at all. It's, uh, so I try and make it very clear to senior executives before we embark on an initiative like this that um, this is not going to be a superficial exercise that's like, here's our new culture, let's have pizza, you know, uh, let's have a party, that this is actually going to be some deep uh, and serious work that the executive team needs to commit to, to doing in advance. And, um, and they need to be also ready to accept whatever the information is that comes back. And the thing is that a lot of times leaders are, are not as in touch with the culture as they think they are because people want, people want leaders to be happy. So the leaders are not always getting all the, the negative information that they might otherwise uh, you know, it's kind of like the water cooler conversation sometimes will shut down when the when the CEO walks by. Um, and so what we're doing in the culture mapping process is we are finding a, a really constructive way to collect that water cooler conversation and share it with leaders so they can actually get access to that stuff. Thank you. Maybe one comment also because we're here in Berlin and for you, but we are Personally, what I'm experiencing here in Berlin since a couple of years, um, there are a lot of large German traditional companies who would like to change their culture. And uh, one hype that is happening that they're starting something like a digital lab innovation center here in Berlin. In, in any case, I think what, it's very interesting to see what you're doing there, and it probably can be used here in Berlin. Thank you. That's right. Hi. Um, could you talk a little bit more um, about the baseline surveys and the ongoing surveys throughout the process? Is that for validating the map or is that for um, checking on the culture, on the growth toward the goal of that culture map? Uh, yeah, actually, I have, a, I have a, some slides that I didn't share just in the interest of time, but I, maybe I could share a little uh, bit here. Tell me if you can see this. Okay, so there's something I wanted that I could share with you about how we go about when we do some of the measuring. We want to measure very simply, um, very simple things. So we're trying to set up, um, I don't know if this makes sense, but we're trying to set up something along the lines of, okay, um, we might want to measure a specific behavior or a perception that people have about a behavior. For example, this is a company that's trying to create a more collaborative culture. So we might ask a question like, do you feel free to, to go where you need to go to do your work, including working from home, if that makes sense? And they might have a simple slider to answer that. Well, I feel at the extreme end, I, uh, on the negative end, I feel chained to my desk. On the very far end, I feel free to move about. And this is a little bit like if you've seen a net promoter score survey, a simple one question or two question survey asking for also more information. So we're asking people for a rating or a score and then more information. And we are usually working with the company um, at the early stage. So I'll, I'll stop sharing now because I think that gives you the main idea that we're working with the company at an early stage to try and determine, all right, what are you measuring now? Are you doing anything? Are you doing employee satisfaction surveys? Are you doing employee engagement surveys? Usually the company has something that they're doing, um, but most, most of the time, even though they may be doing this surveys, they're doing them very infrequently, like maybe once a year, and they're not really making that, uh, those survey results part of their daily, weekly, monthly management activities. They're not looking at that number at the same level of focus that they're looking at their profit numbers, or they're looking at other numbers that are met key metrics in the business. And we are, we are coaching them to make culture actually a key performance indicator, to actually have 
a number that they're looking at where they are actually collecting not just a number but people's um, uh, quotes, a uh, voice, you know, this, you probably, you may have heard of voice of the customer surveys, right? Where you're asking customers to say exactly in their words, how they feel about things. This is a, can be a sort of a, a voice of the employee survey. And what we want to, to encourage uh, companies to do, especially when they're trying to get more intentional about their culture or trying to change their culture is to actually look at that number as a very important uh, business metric to attach uh, performance bonuses and other things to management to uh, to serious change on culture and uh, to measure just like they would anything else. And I think um, the companies that are doing that are finding that they really can make significant change on culture and they uh, uh, sometimes in a relatively short period of time. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I ask something from your uh, we don't have, I would say though, we don't have a standard baseline survey that we, we just throw out there. We, we actually co-design that usually with the company and it's often pretty, you know, built on what they have already existing. And from your experience, um, is that KPI used frequently in, in the business? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wish. Uh, but you know the companies that are the companies that I'm working with usually are uh, they're pretty serious about culture change. They're looking at it as a serious uh, metric. Um, they are uh, they're trying. They're trying. I mean, even even the culture within an executive team can be hard to shift, even if it's even sometimes only five people. Uh, but I think the ones that are doing it the most are uh, seeing the best results. I will say that. Hi, um, I wanted to ask you about different cultures that exist within an organization. So often you'll find that there's maybe a separate culture in the tech departments than there might be for like the rest of the business. Have you come across that? And how do you kind of, like, is it better to go just with one across the whole company? Or is it something that you found there can be two within a company? Or, yeah, how do you settle that? Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I heard the question right. You were saying that there are different subcultures within the company. Like there's an IT culture, there's a might be a culture in finance, there might be a culture in sales. Is that, is that what you were ask, asking yeah, about? I was asking, is there, should there be like one overall culture and then everything feeds into it or how do you manage that? Yeah, there's a, that's a great question because you know you may want a very entrepreneurial culture but that doesn't necessarily mean you want a lot of risk taking in your accounting team, for example, or your finance group. Um, so we have, uh, usually when we do Every company has not only a, a sort of a company culture as a whole, but will have uh, subcultures within it. And what we do when we do the culture mapping, and, we, and I should have probably mentioned this, when we go out and we do the focus group surveys, we're usually uh, trying to collect people who already work together in that when we do those uh, culture mapping exercises, because uh, they're more comfortable, they're more honest, and they will tell us more. And often that we find that some of the biggest enablers and blockers of negative stuff are not within a group, but they are in things that are happening between the groups. And so we might start by, uh, we usually start by talking to the teams that are um, uh, close to the operations, like a finance team or IT. And then we start talking to teams that are very close to customers. And we'll often find uh, very interesting uh, problem areas What's interesting about them is that they are, if you look at the org chart, they don't belong to any one group. So there might be an area, the IT group might be optimizing. So in, in one case, we were working with a company and the IT group was optimizing for cost. Uh, but the, the byproduct of optimizing for cost was they were extremely unresponsive from the perspective of the rest of the organization when they needed things. The IT was not really being very helpful. The IT was a problem when people were trying to get help and trying to move faster and do do certain things. So we often will find that the, there are many of these areas that are not anyone's responsibility on the org chart, but they are in the interactions between different groups and divisions. And culture mapping is quite an interesting uh, exercise for that because we'll, we'll, we're looking for enablers and blockers and behaviors. Groups will often point fingers at other groups and say, well, the problem is we can't get anything from IT or whatever that might be. And IT will say, well, they will have a different description of the problem. And what happens as we do, I call it um, island hopping, because we're kind of like, we're, we're starting with one island and we're trying to you know, uh, move from there to the next island. 
And um, what we're trying to do is figure out and understand what are the things that are underneath all that stuff and what are some of these problems that happen between groups. And uh, often these are insights that I don't, I don't know how you, if there was another way you would get them. You have to actually talk to the groups and <laughs> let them point fingers at each other and then start to, realize, start to find the areas what, what are, what's really going on there. Cool, thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, could, could, you please, uh, could you please give uh, a couple of examples when it was uh, difficult to deploy a culture, new culture within the company? And uh, how did you solve uh, these uh, uh, issues? And uh, also, in case that we are here in the startup world, so, but there are cases uh, when uh, you have like failed to deploy the new culture. Like, why did it happen? And if you can, like, last, uh, but not least, uh, if you could name, in your opinion, what are three biggest uh, threats to building or obstacles to building an efficient uh, company culture? All right, there's a lot of questions in there. I'll, I'll try. Uh, I think I got the gist of it. Um, so let me first say that when the thing that triggered me initially to start thinking about this as a serious problem is uh, in the early 2000s, I was working as a consultant at Nokia, um, the uh, mobile phone company. And Nokia, as you probably realize, or you may, some of you may remember, Nokia was globally celebrated for having one of the best company cultures in the world at the time um, in the... Um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you, Nokia was written up in Harvard Business Review and many other places as the the culture that the wonderful company culture that everyone should every company should aspire to have, and they did have a very strong, very excellent culture. And I was there when um, they were, you know, they were grappling with how they were going to respond to the threat of the iPhone, and you know, as the phone became a digital device. Um, the landscape was shifting and they were trying to deal with that. And they recognized that culture was a thing that needed to change because they had a manufacturing culture and they were going to be entering into a digital software driven world. And I felt helpless to, to, to stop this uh, uh, cra long, slow crash that happened there. Um, and that's what triggered my belief that we needed to do something serious. They tried, they had some culture initiatives. Um, they were very superficial. No one was really digging into or talking about the really deep and difficult issues that they had. Um, they would talk about them in the, they would talk about them in private or in a small group, but they would not talk to the, them about, that was not a public conversation. So that was one of the things that got me thinking about, well, there needs to be a better way for this. There needs to be a way to take those, um, those private conversations and turn them into a public conversation and at least give executives a chance to grapple with those and discuss them and deal with them. Uh, you asked about what the biggest barriers are. I think the, the number one barrier I see is the mindsets and the senior executives. Uh, even sometimes, even when we do the culture mapping and we bring the information to them, um, uh, we see what I can only describe as denial. Uh, so one of two things will, I will often, so the failure pattern looks, shows up in a couple ways. One is the executive team is, um, is uh, in some level of denial about what they're hearing, what the focus groups are bringing up. Uh, they're, in, they're in some level of saying, uh, well, this is a few bad apples. This is uh, this isn't real. I mean, this is this is um, you know why are we being so negative? Uh, blah blah blah. And another pattern is that uh, we've heard all this before. And we know this. Um, why you know? And I think that when they start to grapple with the idea that what we haven't done, you know, I'm just seeing this uh, what I would call a failure pattern on a project right now that's going on where. Um, the senior team was in the room. They took responsibility. They actually each each senior leader took a part of this culture change, and they um, they took responsibility for it. And I went back later for a three month checkup to see how they're doing. And the senior executives had delegated all of the culture work to a team, 
a culture team. They, in, in my view, they had absolved themselves of responsibility. And, and, and in, 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 in actual fact, when you're doing a culture change initiative, the senior executives can't delegate that. They have to show up differently. They have to take personal responsibility. They have to make that an executive priority. Um, it means, you know, you know, you, you start eating in the ca company cafeteria. Things like, you know, we're trying to create a more collaborative culture. It means having conversations in the open or in the hallways. It means uh, executives go to visit personally and have meetings with groups in other departments. Um, when executives are not visibly changing their behavior, the culture initiative is, uh, in my view, the writing is on the wall that that thing is going to fail. So it does come down in a lot of cases to finding ways to ha get the executive team to hold themselves accountable and hold each other accountable and finding ways to make, you know, even give the employees the ability to hold them accountable. And that's why one of the reasons why I think the measurement is so important. Um, you want to be, you do want to be doing, you want to be surveying your employees on a regular basis, just as often as you're surveying your customers. And you want to understand what the things are that they see that are problematic, that are getting in their way of, of doing the work that needs to be done. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing. I think Luke Gerstner said in one of his books, uh, if I didn't have to, the culture is the hardest thing to deal with. If I didn't have to take on the company culture, I would not have. I took it on because I had to. And I think that in cult companies where culture is a problem and it needs to change, uh, it's extremely difficult. It's one of the most difficult things you could ever do. It, uh, the analogy that I have used is imagine 5,000 people trying to quit smoking all at the same time. That's what it's like. And that's really what you're embarking on. Um, so I, there are more failure patterns than I can name. Um, the success pattern is the one that's very narrow. It's a committed executive team. It's a commitment to measure and uh, get feedback on a regular basis and a commitment to change you know, behavior, actually literally come into work and show up differently every day. And um, yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> We have time for one, one more question. Thank you, everybody. Sure. Hello, I'm very curious to know what kind of tips and recommendations you have for the moderators who are going to work with the model during the sessions. Yes. Well, um, Here's my one number one recommendation. So we, I've been, uh, Alex and I have been out uh, talking about this. I've been doing workshops and training people all around the world. Uh, it's probably about, a, it's probably about, there's a, there's a group on LinkedIn, culture mapping group on LinkedIn with about, I think a, a thousand or so members, many of whom are trained practitioners have at least been through the workshop and trained how to use the culture map. I do not recommend, my number one recommendation is do not try to do this for yourself at your own company. You will, you are going to, you know, um, number one, you're inside the culture. So there's going to be questions that are going to be much more difficult for you to ask than an outside person could ask. There are going to be things that are political that you may have difficulty to touch that an outside person could touch. Um, uh, it's very, very risky and, and difficult to try and do this inside in your own company. If you're the leader, if you're a manager, uh, I recommend that, that you not try to do this yourself. It's very difficult. It's, it's something that you really need an outside perspective and an outside person to come in and help with this. Um, someone who does not really know the culture, who can ask the stupid questions, and who, who can speak truth to power, who can speak even difficult truths to the senior executive team without, uh, you know, uh, and be honest. That's very, very difficult for an internal person to do. I, I think it's great to practice and do, do stuff within your team. But if you want to take, un undertake serious culture change in your company, find someone from the outside who can help you with it. I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's really important to do that. And there, I've been out training and there's a bunch of people uh, out there who are doing this and they are some really good consultants who are, who are trained up on this who can, who can help you. Thank you. There were more questions in the front. One more, Dave, is that okay? So there were some people raising their hands. Yeah, the yeah. yeah. I don't okay. have anything for... Okay, you know, this, this throw is as hard as you can to the front. Oh, ouch. <laughs> it's, it's tough. Um, you, you spoke a lot about like um, implementing this and with management teams and executive teams. 
And I'm wondering if you have any experience or how this might differ in like a self-managed team, like a company using something like democracy or something like this. Yeah, I think, I mean, so if you have a, a self-managed team, there's, I, I you know, uh, I don't want to be too draconian about saying don't do this for yourself. I think it's always good to have an outside perspective a person doing it. If you have a very small team and you want to create the culture that you want and you want to use this as a tool to help you have that dialogue, I think that's wonderful. I think it's great. Um, if you're working, uh, uh, I shared with you earlier the board thing tool that I've been working on to try and make it possible for distributed teams to do this a little bit more easily. Um, I think in a small a startup or a small self-managed team, and I know that a lot of people uh, in this group may fall into that category, I think it's a great tool to say, even if you're just getting started, what's the culture that we want? You know, how do we want to show up? How do we want to, what are the behaviors that we want to reward and encourage? What are the behaviors we don't want? Um, and I, a lot of times what I've found is some of the best things in a culture mapping exercise are not things that came up within the context of the current company. There are things, uh, so that some of the, a lot of the times that people are saying, yeah, you know, there's something we used to do that I thought was great. You know, I don't know why we stopped doing it, but it was this thing we used to do. We used to celebrate everyone. We'd have an awards thing every month where the people would get up on the stage and they would be re recognized for doing outstanding work. Or, uh, yeah, well, there's something that used to happen, not in this company, but in my old job that I really loved, where we had a buddy system. A new Anyone who's new came on to the company, they would get a mentor who would help them understand and learn the ropes and, and learn the company. I think we could do that here. So a lot of the ideas, especially the imaginary, uh, the, the thinking about future state and designing the culture that you want, a lot of those ideas may come up in asking questions about what was the best team you were ever on? What made it a great team? What was great about that team that you were on? What made it, what made it a place that you look forward to showing up every day? What made that team great? So you don't need to limit your questions to only what's happening in the current company. And especially if you're in a startup and you're in design mode, I think it would be great to step in with a culture map to your team and say, let's talk about well, how we want to be. And let's talk about the best teams that we've ever been on and what made those teams great and start filling out the culture map. What were the behaviors? What were the outcomes? What were the enablers and blockers? What made that possible? What, what you know, that kind of thing. Um, I know, for example, in my company, we had, um, we had a, we moved to a new office and we, we went from having everyone having a desk to like we called it the Starbucks office because no, you just showed up and you could sit wherever you wanted. And that was a tremendous uh, enabler of, um, of positive behavior on that team. It changed a lot of the, it was funny, you know, you wouldn't think of people just having their own desk as creating a territorial culture and having no desk as, as creating a collaborative culture, but that's exactly what happened. When we changed the office space, the culture changed from something that was a little bit more territorial to much more uh, collaborative and, and uh, team oriented. So there, there, a lot of those, a, a lot of, you'll find a lot of people who've had a work history can tell you about things that have worked in the past, and the culture map could be a great tool to facilitate um, those kind of conversations. Okay. Then, uh... And then thank you again very much to, uh, to join us this evening. Thanks for having me. And I will, I will invite anyone who wants to to uh, reach out on Twitter or uh, you know join that LinkedIn group. It's just called the Culture Mapping Group. And uh, if you want to get on that board and, and leave any questions, uh, I'll try and answer them as well. And uh, um, Stefan has the link to that you can share. I, I share the link to the to the groups etc. on the uh, on the meetup. Wonderful. Okay, then have, right. a, have a great remaining day on your side. Excellent. Take, take lots of pictures for me so I can see your culture maps tonight. Oh, yeah, we will do that. We will do it. Okay, great. Okay, okay have fun. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. So, yeah, um, now we start the second part of the evening. We will have the occasion to, uh, to grab a drink and so, but... First of all, I would like to explain you what will happen now, and actually, we would like to try out 